What a joy to be reminded that we must always be learning about our faith, practicing our faith. As a reminder, we will be spending a lot of time in the Gospel of Mark between now and Easter. And so this morning, our scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Mark. As we come to this time, I invite you to stand as you're able as we hear this reading from the Gospel. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. This is the last message in the series, Beginnings, a good series to begin the new year. We looked at a shame named and now claimed for today. So let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of our hearts and minds, may they be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength, our redeemer, and our rock. Amen. For 12 years, I was on the Board of Trustees of the Methodist Mission Home in San Antonio. Methodist Mission Home is now called Providence Place. For over 25 years, they have been in ministry, and one of their leading programs is as an adoption agency, and over 6,000 children have been adopted through this ministry. Providence Place began as a home for unwed mothers, but quickly became an adoption agency. When I went on the board in 1988, open adoption was already the policy and procedure for adoptions. Expectant mothers carefully studied a book that families had sent in of their biographies, of their photographs, stories, and their hopes of couples and families anticipating adoption. Mothers chose who the adopting parents would be. Once a couple had been chosen, the selected parents are able to claim their new girl or boy as their own. It is a dramatic and emotional journey, but the end result is that parents can claim the child as their own. Adoption is a wonderful way for parents who cannot have children to receive the wondrous gift of a child. This is an awesome way for families to grow and increase. Parents who adopted can always tell their child, we wanted you, we chose you, we claim you as our own son, daughter, as a member of our family. To lay claim on another person is a significant act, whether by adoption or birth. Parents proclaim, you are ours, we claim you as part of our family. Our scripture lesson this morning is at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. You will note that it is Mark 1, the first chapter, obviously, and beginning with the 14th verse, which is not... Uh, but just a few verses into the gospel. As Jesus starts his ministry of teaching, preaching, and healing, he announces the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has come near. 
repent and believe the good news. Another translation says, the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God has come near or is at hand because Jesus has come near. Jesus is at hand. You can reach out and touch the kingdom because the kingdom has come in Jesus. Jesus brings us God's love and grace. And that is good news. That is entrance to the kingdom. And that makes us king, kingdom members as followers of Jesus. Did you know that? You are a kingdom member. You are the recipient of God's salvation, of God's grace, of God's inviting you to participate with Him in His kingdom. In proclaiming the kingdom, Jesus is revealing the Father, revealing the very heart of God, a heart of love, a heart of grace, a heart of mercy, a heart of forgiveness, a heart of salvation. Jesus shows us the very nature of God, and that is good news. As soon as Jesus proclaims the, the good news, he calls his first four disciples, Simon, Peter, and Andrew, James, and John. Jesus claims them as his, as his disciples and simply says, follow me. Follow me. Follow me and I will make you fishers of people. The New Testament makes it clear that as Christians, we are all disciples. We are all followers of Jesus. So this morning, there are three great affirmations I want to emphasize for us. First, God claims us as his followers because we are God's beloved children. This is the good news. We are God's beloved children. This is our identity. We are each and every one of us a beloved child of God. Last week, Pastor Jenny did a superb presentation for us in her message of naming us as God's beloved, taken from Jesus' baptism when God announced, this is my beloved son. Jesus taught and revealed that as he is God's beloved son, so we are all beloved women and men and children, all children of God. Becoming a Christian can be as profound as accepting our identity as God's beloved. When we affirm we are God's beloved, we are stating we believe in God. We believe in God that His grace, His love, His salvation is for all of us and for all the world. Second, we are called followers. We are called to follow Jesus. As the first disciples answered the call to follow Jesus, He calls us as well. In many ways, this is what being a Christian means, following Jesus. We are to follow Jesus in our action, words, and witness. Several years ago, the letters WWJD were prominent in churches. What would Jesus do? The question is still relevant for followers of Jesus. We need to ask ourselves, how would Jesus respond and that should lead and guide us on how we live. Now, a little bit later on, our chancel choir has a wonderful anthem entitled, I've Decided to Follow Jesus. And that is our calling as Christians. Several years ago, we did a sermon series called 167. Some of you may remember it. We got many wonderful responses to that series. There are 168 hours in a week. If you spend one hour in worship, what are you doing with all the other hours of that week? How are you following Jesus and living out the 167 hours that remain in each week? 
How is your witness for Christ as a Christian and as a member of this church? In his book, A Second Touch, Keith Miller told a story of a busy, busy executive living in an eastern city who was rushing to catch a train. He had been so caught up in the pressures, hassles, and stresses of the business world that he was worn to a frazzle. There were so many demands, so many deadlines. So this day, he rebelled. On this particular morning, he decided really to try to be a Christian instead of just talking about it. This day, no matter what, he was going to live in the spirit of Jesus Christ's love. Just as he was about to board the train, he accidentally bumped into a little boy who was carrying a large box of jigsaw puzzle. The pieces scattered everywhere. Normally, the man would have jumped on the train and rushed to the office without helping the boy. But he remembered his decision to live in the spirit of Christ's love. So he stopped, he bent down, and he helped the boy pick up all the pieces of the puzzle. They, they found them, they gathered them, and put them in, in the box. The train started to pull out as they were picking up the pieces. The little boy watched him carefully, realizing the sacrifice the man had made and realizing the man missed his train in order to help. And so when they had all gathered the pieces, put them back in the box, the little boy looked up at the man and said, Mister, are you Jesus? Now let me ask you something. Has anyone ever seen the love of Jesus that powerfully in you? As a follower of Jesus, are you showing others your faith, your commitment, your faithfulness to your accepting and receiving Christ as your Lord and Savior, as well as your vow of membership to this church? We are called to be followers of Jesus. Third, as followers of Jesus Christ, we need to realize how crucial, how important our witness is to keeping the church alive and in existence. As Jesus called, claimed, and chose his disciples at the beginning of his ministry, so he relied on his disciples after his resurrection to carry his message and to grow and spread his message and the good news throughout the world. Now, we are Jesus' followers, his disciples in our world. Jesus needs us to be his witnesses, to spread his love and grace to all, to offer forgiveness and mercy to all, to overcome hate, injustice, violence, racism, intolerance, to transform the world, offering people God's love and grace and salvation. The goal, mission, and vision of the United Methodist Church is to make disciples for Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Did you realize that as you join this church, you are engaging in a movement to transform the world for Jesus Christ? We may not emphasize this that much, but that is our purpose, goal, and aim. All that we do with children, youth, and adults in ministry, mission, service, worship, are to be witnesses for Christ for the transformation of the world. Therefore, therefore, your witness, your commitment to Christ, your sharing your faith journey are crucial in helping make disciples for Christ and encouraging others to receive Christ and salvation to continue to make Memorial Drive United Methodist Church alive and vibrant. 
in our conference room upstairs with the pastor's offices, there is a painting hanging on the wall. It was commissioned and painted by Kenneth Wyatt in 1984 to commemorate the 200th anniversary of Methodism in America. This painting that I'm going to awkwardly, I'm sure, hold up, but is also, thank goodness, up on the screens. This painting shows John Wesley on the shore at the tip of the boat on land with several others in the boat, but two of them are Thomas Coke and Francis Asbury. John Wesley is sending them to America to begin the Methodist Church in America. This was in, night, in, in, this was in 1784, the same year that the American Revolution was coming to an end. Coke and Asbury are in that small boat which will take them to a larger ship for their journey to America. It is a great painting, and it is simply entitled, Offer Them Christ. Offer Them Christ was a favorite phrase of John Wesley to the clergy and the lay people. He envisioned that that was our main mission, was to offer people Christ. That's all we can do is share the good news and then allow God to work in the other people's lives, to work in their hearts and souls and, and lives to respond to that good news. We offer people Christ, the good news, but God does the converting. God works in their lives in their response to Christ. So this is our mission to transform the world for Jesus Christ. And it continues today, and it, it needs to continue in and through us in all that we do. Yes, we are called, claimed, and chosen as God's followers to continue the work of offering them Christ, offering Christ to the world. As Jesus called Peter, Andrew, James, and John, so he calls us as his followers, as his witnesses. We are all beloved children, and we should be witnesses to all of God's love and grace, to all God's offer of salvation, of abundant life, and eternal life. This is what we are to do to transform the world for Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen.